almost a year ago, as we began to work on this Congress, we wanted to use the moment of our 30th anniversary to turn outwards, to offer to the world the wisdom of psychotherapy and the hope of psychotherapy. The perspective a year ago was that the world was endangered by climate crisis, pollution and environmental change. And that is of course still true, but as I stand here today, we have a new aspect of our endangered world because of the invasion of Ukraine. Both Ukrainian and Russian colleagues are with us today. Ukraine and Russia are both part of EAP. And my message to you is that we warmly welcome you to the Congress and we offer you support and care through the Congress today and that this will give you hope through the vision and inspiration of this Congress and its participants. Our message of the hope of psychotherapy for our endangered world is so relevant for you now in this present moment. The hope of psychotherapy has actually been expressed in a very tangible way through the World Council for Psychotherapy statement to the Russian government. The statement was written just after the invasion of Ukraine and it has now been translated into many languages, including Arabic, Hebrew and Persian. EAP is part of the World Council for Psychotherapy and the statement which has been submitted to the Russian government says, the World Council for Psychotherapy calls upon the Russian government to immediately cease the invasion of Ukraine, stop the war, respect the law of nations, and bring back all Russian troops and weapons to their home country. It is our view as psychotherapists that military invasion never solves problems and never achieves its intended aims. Instead, it creates immense damage and causes destruction on many levels, which can reverberate through the generations transgenerationally. This includes the personal suffering and deep trauma of both families and individuals at somatic, mental and emotional levels. Psychotherapists are committed to peaceful negotiation, dialogue and debate in conflict resolution, and we condemn war and violence. We call upon the Russian government to stop the war and establish peace through diplomacy in a thoughtful and mutually respectful manner. We hope that the highest principles of the human spirit will prevail. And with all our hearts, we wish that a resolution can be found which will restore freedom. This statement from the World Council for Psychotherapy has been submitted to the Russian government. Alfred has a phrase use the door when it is open. I understand he used it at the start of the founding of EAP. And I think we have that moment now, use the door when it is open. We are an organization whose time has come and a profession whose time has come. The focus of this Congress is to discover if we can offer hope to humankind in the face of the worst catastrophe that we are facing, the threat of climate crisis, increasing pollution and reduced biodiversity. We are not engineers or politicians or policy makers, but we understand the human mind, the ways in which defences block and distort thinking. 
the ways in which addictions hold the mind in their pathological grip, and we might think here of fossil fuels. The ways in which the human mind can change and heal to become resilient, healthy, functional and effective. So can we use our understanding and our psychotherapeutic models to help in any way in the process of changing attitudes on a global scale? A recent paper I read by an atmospheric scientist from New Zealand stated that from the technological standpoint, we have all the solutions we need to solve the crisis. From the technological point, we have all the solutions we need to solve the crisis. But he said, what we don't have is the right mindset. We are living as though we are on an infinite planet with infinite resources. And a change of human mindset is needed to live on our finite planet with finite resources. Can we offer any help with this change in mindset? We don't know the answer to this yet. This is what we hope to discover through this Congress. So many of the approaches to the climate crisis and problems of our endangered world are looking for solutions and offering solutions. But the psychotherapeutic approach doesn't look for solutions. Solutions can so easily be misguided and be much more about the person wishing to solve the problem than about the problem itself. At its worst, looking for solutions is one more attempt to hold with ego, to dominate with ego. And so if we look for too many, if we just go for solutions, we might end up repeating some of the mistakes of the past. And we can perhaps all think of ways in which we see that that happens. What we have to offer is expertise and experience, long years of experience in the human mindset, the way in which this can change. We are in a privileged position as psychotherapists, and it seems that this is increasing. The pandemic has changed our work. We have moved online. We did a survey across Europe of psychotherapists who are part of EAP and asked them about their work during the pandemic, and it was moving and a source of pride to realize that psychotherapists had completely adapted the way of working during the pandemic. The resistance to working online had gone because the bigger need was to help those in need during the pandemic. And the way to do that was online. And so psychotherapists moved online through the pandemic and then became creative in discovering how are we able to give psychotherapy, offer psychotherapy, conduct the therapeutic process through on the online platforms. And it seems that alongside this move online, our influence seems to have increased. Lots of people describe increased demand. And we're being told that people, including young people, are listening to us, noticing us. We have a voice and we have the opportunity to use it to offer wisdom to our profession, the wisdom of our profession to the wider world. So let us take a moment in this Congress to be the psychotherapists that we are. Let us not be diminished by what we can't do and be empowered by how we can be. Let us let go, be without memory or desire, the famous words of Bion, without memory or desire. Let us do what we do best and are trained and experienced in. Let us sit with the greatest problems facing humankind 
speak and listen to each other. Let us allow ourselves to be in the place of unknowing, not knowing. And in this way, clarity, imagination, insight, and hope can emerge. It is within our expertise, and yet it is unfamiliar to us. We are used to working very invisibly and confidentially. It goes against our professional and perhaps personal principles to work visibly and openly. But let us engage with this and see if we have anything to offer and give voice to it. We may discover we haven't anything to offer, but it will still have been worth uniting together in the task of trying. We're people who work in a sustained, rhythmical way, and this strength changes how people talk to us, what they share with us, how they trust us, how they heal. And this is similar, the need is similar. The response of humanity to the climate crisis is not going to be a quick fix. Our sustained therapeutic approach is relevant to this and well attuned. How can we be as humanity to respond to the climate crisis and thrive? And that word I think is going to come back and back during the course of the day, thrive. How is it possible to thrive in this crisis? But then we know that in times of adversity, there can be growth. We know this in our work. There's a very strong parallel process between conducting this Congress and the endangered world. Starting the preparation for the Congress a year ago, we have had to face and deal with the harsh realities of the pandemic. We have had to continually adapt. I think this is the fifth model for this Congress. We've had to be imaginative and do things we wouldn't normally do. We've continually gone back to the principles of psychotherapy to think about how to do things in the best way. We've discovered and experienced that in the need to adapt again and again, we have become sensitive, responsive, spontaneous, playful even. And this has sparked our creativity and imagination and changed this Congress. It's had an impact, a positive impact on this Congress. We've had to collaborate with each other, support each other, inspire each other and be a strong team. We've also had to work incredibly hard. Everybody involved in this Congress has worked incredibly hard. We have different gifts and areas of expertise and we have brought these together fruitfully. So the parallel process here is that it is the same approach that's needed in our endangered world, endangered by climate crisis, endangered by current crisis. Humanity will have to continually adapt. Humankind will have to be creative, imaginative, and do things that we wouldn't normally do. We will have to continually think about the most important principles to hold on to and to work within, but this can become hope for our world. As part of my own personal response to our endangered world, last autumn, I began to drive an electric car. The whole experience of researching it, test driving it, purchasing it, was completely new. We never went to a car showroom. Instead, we went to an educational outlet explaining the technology of the electric car. And then we configured 
and ordered the car online. Online? We ordered the car online. And it was delivered to our home, brought to our front gate. <laughs> Throughout the whole process, there was no pressure, there was no hard sell, there was no powerful ego trying to squeeze a bit more money out of us. No powerful ego at all, just freedom of choice. My thinking about starting to drive an electric car was that this was a good thing to do for the planet. I was completely unprepared for the fact that driving it is such fun. It is extraordinary fun. You glide silently along. There's no noise of an engine and the sensation is of floating and moving smoothly and gliding along. My driving behavior has completely changed. This is actually the most important part of the story. My driving behavior has completely changed. I'll be honest and admit, I quite liked speed. <laughs> but with the electric car, suddenly it's not about speed anymore. It's just, um, my driving behavior and my thinking have just completely changed. My mindset when I'm driving has changed. It's not about speed. I enjoy the drive. I enjoy the journey and the beauty of the journey. Nature outside the window and the city outside the window, I'm a bit more closely connected to and a bit more part of. So I think my brain is engaged in a very different way. My ego is less and my joy is more. My ego is less and my joy is more. My hope is also more because this is the future and our shared future. And I discover it's rather wonderful. Just a few months ago, the COP26 conference in Glasgow marked the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era in the history of humankind. Not the end, because it will take a long time to bring it to a close. And perhaps there is an element of addiction, as I mentioned earlier, which will mean it, it will take a while to bring it to a close and we will need a transition. But it is the beginning of the end. We have already begun to lay the foundations for a new era, the green era. The green era that in addition to the technology needed can bring a new mindset. Our behavior can change as mine has. Our ego can become less. Perhaps in the green era, we can live with increased imagination and creativity. An era in which we can discover how we can thrive in new ways, ways which are natural to the human psyche and help us with mental balance. The fossil fuel era began with industrialization and it harnessed not only the power of fossil fuels, but also the capacity of the human brain to think scientifically, to forge pro progress, and through the power of the ego, to imagine and realize incredible development. The human ego was rewarded with better living conditions. And in the years since industrialization, the ego of humankind has become strong. It's become too strong, becoming dominant over the planet that supports its life. Some of you may be familiar with work looking at the ways in which 
industrialization has changed our brains. I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but it seems that there's enough research evidence that we, are, we do have a sense that our brains have changed in a slightly asymmetric way. Our scientific thinking, mostly in the left hemisphere, has, has, uh, has become stronger. And our right hemisphere, which is much more closely connected with, with our world, responds, receives incoming information, is intuitive, is sensitive, is responsive, has been less engaged through the process of industrialization. And so perhaps there are ways in which our mindset really literally has changed during industrialization. But maybe there's the hope that even that can change in a green era once we really begin to live within it. And also what we know is that what can bring healing and restore the balance is a therapeutic approach. Individual therapy, yes, but also therapeutic thinking on a bigger level. We work on coherence, on rebalancing, on communication, on connection, on metaphor, on creativity, on imagination, on enabling people to thrive. During my preparation for the Congress, I've done extensive reading about all the most up-to-date literature in this area. Actually, this I'm pleased to say, this has increased my hope about the ways in which humanity can rise, adapt and thrive. Nature can recover around us if we give it the space to do so. I read about a wonderful example of this where off the, in the Gulf of California, off the coast of Mexico, the waters had been overfished for so long that the sea had become sterile. The, the, the natural um, fauna had, had dis disappeared because it had been overfished and then the whole web of life had disintegrated. And so an, um, a natural park, a national park was created in order to protect the area within the Gulf of, Mex the Gulf of California and fishing wasn't allowed. They checked it after two years and there was very little change. They checked it after 10 years and they discovered that the whole web of life had completely recovered. Every single element of the food chain had recovered. The plankton, the, the, the smaller fish, the larger fish uh, uh, had all recovered. The stocks were there and they were pleased because the sharks had come back. The, shark, the fact that the sharks came back meant that there was a, a reliable food chain which built up, built up, built up, and so there was food for the sharks. So it was a success to them when the sharks came back. And this is a really powerful example of the cycles of renewal that are there within our world bringing healing, bringing health. So there are some signs of hope that if we can allow the world around us to recover, if we give it space, it will recover. It's vital to understand how our psychotherapy profession can ensure that we tackle the situation of the existential crisis we're in, in a holistic, and considerate manner. How can we make sense of the situation? How can we retain the capacity to think? This is what we will do together in this Congress. This is what our keynote speakers and our past presidents will lead us in.
This, we can, this is what we can do for each other in the reflective discussion groups today and tomorrow. And through this, we shall see how we can rise in our limited situation. We shall discover how we can shift upwards. We shall imagine the ways to adapt to our situation and we'll find the ways to thrive instead of being destroyed. I'm really conscious that this is a two-day congress. It needs to be a two-day congress, but also it's your weekend. It's your Saturday and Sunday that you are giving to this congress. So may I invite you to be attentive to yourself in these two days. Your humanity has more intensity and is more alive than you can possibly imagine. In carefully attending to yourself, you will live more fully in your humanity. In living more fully in your humanity, you will discover, and perhaps you already know this, that rather miraculously, you actually will relate better, more openly to the world and to people. If we take the moment, if we take the time to withdraw and meet our own needs, then we're better able to re-engage. So there are simple ways of living more fully in your humanity in these two days, which I just offer to you. When you're making a cup of tea or coffee in the breaks, allow yourself to be attentive to the simple task of making the coffee sitting down, savouring it, that's an important bit, savouring it, fully tasting it. Be attentive to your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. If you feel tired at the end of the day because of so much time on the screen, step outside and be attentive to the wind, the rain, the sun, the garden. It is our full humanity that we wish to bring to these huge questions that we are facing. It is our full humanity that we need to live within, need to live within so that we can shift upwards and find ways to thrive. The part we can play consistent with and informed by our psychotherapeutic approach is to analyze the mindset of humankind and recognize the part our own ego is playing in the tragedy which is unfolding. What we can do is help humanity to be aware of this, raise awareness of it as we would in individual work, raise awareness, not sleep through it, not only have it in the unconscious mind. We have superb and distinguished keynote speakers and a panel of honored past presidents of EAP. And we all thank them from our heart for their openness to this challenge. And we look forward so much to listening to them. All delegates online, are part of this process. You are all part of this process. We, as much as we can, let's work together. So particularly in the discussion groups, one today and one tomorrow, there isn't an agenda, there, isn't, there is just a time frame, and groups of up to 12 will be put together. And then if you open up the conversation with each other, and share with each other your thoughts, your feelings, your insights about what you see is the hope of psychotherapy for our endangered world. So it's your opportunity to speak and have a voice. It's your opportunity to be listened to. If you have wisdom that you feel you wish to offer from your group, either from the group collectively or from yourself as an individual member of it, 
especially in today's group this is true, please put it in the chat that you have on your screen in front of you. Please put it in the chat. Short phrases are better than long lines of text. The essence, the kernel, the center, the focus of what is the hope of psychotherapy. I'm going to finish with a poem, but before I do, I'd just like to say that after the poem, we will take our first break. And at 11 o'clock, Central European time, um, the next session will begin. And you have a choice. So if you wish to join the round table of past presidents, please select the breakout room on your screen. I'll say that again. If you want to join the round table of past presidents of EAP, please select the breakout room option on your screen. If you wish to listen to the presentations of our colleagues, Barbara Fitzgerald and Tom Warnicker, please select the main stage. So for Barbara and Tom, select the main stage. The poem is called The Hill we climb. And it's written by Amanda Gorman, that beautiful young woman. She wrote the poem for the inauguration of President Joe Biden. Some of you may have seen it. It's actually quite long, the poem. So here is just the opening section and the closing section of the poem. The hill we climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, the grief we have borne, and yet the dawn is ours before we know it. Let the planet say this is true, that even as we have grieved, we have grown. That even as we hurt, we hope. That even as we tire, we try. If we are to live up to our own time, how we thrive will lie in the bridges that we have made. The hill we climb, if only we dare. When day comes, we step out of the shade, unafraid. The new dawn begins. For there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it. There is oh, always light, if only we are brave enough to be it. There is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it. There is always light. If only we are brave enough to be it. I'm not sure how that comes across in the translation, but those final phrases are so important. And what they mean is, there is always light because we are the light. Each one of us and together. We are the light. There is always hope because we are, all of us, the hope. There is always hope because we are the hope.